Hello. My name is Clay Mackle. I'm the Chief Software Architect at FileMaker. Uh, I work directly for the Vice President of Engineering, Frank Liu. And uh, today we'll be talking about one of the under the hood sessions about the Draco engine itself. Ah, that worked. Okay, so who am I? I, ban I began working at Apple back in 1986. I was working on the Mac Terminal project back then. And when Claris was formed, I was one of the first engineers to uh, move over to Claris. I was actually employee 15 at Claris. Um, then Claris eventually turned into FileMaker after a while. Uh, and I didn't actually really start working on the FileMaker product until like the, the early 90s. I was working on other products that Claris was uh, d uh, delivering at that point. Actually, all the stuff I worked on never actually shipped at that point. So they actually were kind of a little bit worried when I came to the FileMaker team saying that, hey, you never shipped anything. Why are you coming to the team? But it eventually went out. So, um, so it actually, it was kind of a rocky road because the first version I worked on was doing the Microsoft Windows 3.0 port. Uh, at that point, FileMaker was only a, a Mac product. Uh, Neshoba had actually tried bringing it over to the Windows platform a couple of times. And we actually started doing that work too. But then when Scully got kicked out, the next president of Apple came in and said, nope, no more Windows work. So we stopped work and I went on to something else. Then the next president came in into Apple. Then we started up working again. Then the president changed again and we stopped working. And then the, lastly, when uh, um, the, 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 the Emilio came in, I think that's when we started up again. Uh, then we finally finished the work on, actually because I was actually working on Windows 2.0 at the first part of it, but by the time it got canceled and restarted so many times, we were on 3.0 at that point. After that point, I started working on the, the FileMaker Pro server, or the FileMaker server product. Uh, we were, I was taking some of the assembly code that was from the Neshoba and converting it to C, and we were able to get it to uh, bring it up on the server product. This is when John Thatcher came in and uh, started working on the server product at that point. Um, uh, worked with that point. After that point, um, I worked on, I kind of did the, the first instant web publisher. There's, there's really was the instant web publisher one, instant web publisher two, and then web direct. But the first version was mine. We were using CDML, which came from Lasso Technology. Um, we got that out. Uh, I always like that logo with the building and the folders floating around it, but that's my preference. Um, also at that point, uh, then I started working on the Draco engine. There was a core team, and I'll show a picture of the core team of who did that stuff. And then most recently, uh, worked on the FileMaker Go product, and just because I love engines so much, I go through and I repair tractor engines in my spare time. Uh, you have to do something. Uh, for the contents of this session, I'm going to first go through a, a, a brief uh, history of the, the engines inside FileMaker. Uh, starting with what was before Draco and the Draco engine after that. Then I'll go and talk a little bit about how data is stored and downloaded, how it kind of moves around in the system. Uh, then go through the file opening process, well, all the steps it has to go through when you open a file over the network, and, some kind of, and a little bit about how it opens locally, but that's not as interesting. At the end, I'll go through the changes that we made in the Draco engine for 15, the most recent release that has come out, and then do a Q&A at the end of that. I lost the connection. So the history there. So you've seen this chart many a times now, and I can't put in the new item that's on the chart yet since this is going to be uh, put up on the web. But um, this is something that like three years ago where uh, Dominique has finally went through and started wanting to call FileMaker a platform. And before that time period, we never really were able to talk about the Draco engine and how things actually worked under the hood at that point. And it's more recently that we actually are starting to use the term Draco. And the, the term Draco comes from Christopher Krim, who was one of the uh, first people that worked on FileMaker. And he really loved the movie that, was, that had uh, Sean Connery in it as a dragon. And so that's where the name came from. People keep asking, why is it called Draco? You know, is there something you know, serious about it? No, it's just a movie reference that we liked and it stuck. So there's uh, five eras that I split the, the, the FileMaker engine, the, the eras of the FileMaker engine into. Uh, last year when I presented some of this over in Europe, uh, couldn't, I, I really was saying four, but now, now that we've gotten into the design surface and I will talk about more of the work in Draco that's going into the design surface, uh, it's really now five eras too. So the, the, the first era happened back in the, you know, the 85 or so, and this is what we call the, the DOS pre-Claris. This is before Claris purchased the product, and these are the, the splash screens from there. 
I didn't really understand their numbering process. You had FileMaker 1, then FileMaker Plus, and then FileMaker 4. But um, <laughs> it doesn't get any better when you go to the next slide. Um, the database at that point was a flat file. It did have lookups, so you could pull data from other tables and bring it in. And we still have lookups in FileMaker 2. But you had no relational, relational uh, access to data at that point. Uh, there is very little or no scripting, depending on which version you're talking about. But what does come from this version that is still going strong at this time is the, the storage mechanism and the, and the concepts of how data is actually stored in FileMaker. All data in FileMaker is pretty much stored as text. Even number fields, date fields, time fields, everything is stored as text. And that goes way back to the roots at this point. Um, they always wanted to be able to, for a user to go into the scheme and make changes easily to go between numbers, dates, and times. Because, you, you know, as you're designing your database, you know, well, what is this field going to be? And you go along and say, well, this really should be a number field. And they didn't want to just throw away all the data. You could just transition between all of these things. The container field is really the only one that's different from those things. You can't really transition from a container field back to a, any of the other types back and forth. And also the storage mechanism of how these this data is actually stored on disk, is called the HBAM layer. And I'll go into more of how the HBAM layer works and what it does. But the, the design and the algorithms and, and just kind of the, the theory of how things should operate all comes back from this time period, back in 1985. Then we had the, the, the flat file era. This is after Claris purchased the product and basically moved all development over to California. Uh, this is when, like around 88 time period, ScriptMaker was added. Um, the layout mode was changed to the MacDraw style because we had our family of products and MacDraw was our drawing product. So we had the patterns, the color, everything pretty much looked like MacDraw inside FileMaker for doing drawing your layout objects. Um, the server version came out this period. The Windows versions came out of this period. This is when runtime came out. And we knew that uh, being a flat file database wasn't going to last very long, that we would actually have to go through and be a relational database at that point. So there's other, this uh, engine team was formed called Spectre. Um, I'm not quite sure where that one came from, the, the name for that one. But it, um, it was started up, and it was going to be kind of a more SQL-style database engine. Now, we knew that there was going to be a mismatch between the SQL engine and how FileMaker did things. So this is when Christopher Krim was given the job of writing this uh, supposedly thin layer to map FileMaker to SQL. And that's where the Draco project actually started. So Draco actually just started as a thin layer between FileMaker and a SQL-like uh, uh, database engine. Then we get into the early relational time period. Um, creating that engine was taking some time, and then we got really concerned because Microsoft, uh, we got these rumors that Microsoft Access was going to come to the Macintosh, and that it was going to kill our market, and you know, we had to, you know, had to respond to that, and we had to get relational fast. Uh, so we came up with a relational model that happened that lasted all the way through the 6.0 time frame. And that's doing relationships between one file to another file, because there was only one table in each file. And you, in your file, you're defining how your file is related to that file. Um, no join graph or anything like that. Uh, during this time period, we were also converting. I had done the assembly conversion code earlier to get to the server product. But at this point, we were doing the conversion from Pascal to C++. Um, FileMaker was originally written in Pascal, and we actually went through and studied things. You know, we were looking at uh, Smalltalk. We were looking at uh, actually a bunch of other languages at that time period, trying to decide which one. Because C++ was still kind of early in those time periods. You had to use like C front, which would compile it into actual C code, and it would take hours to compile and stuff like that. But uh, we were we were pretty confident that C++ was going to win the you know the language wars during that time period. And during this time period, the Spectre engine was still just kind of limping along. It wasn't getting anywhere, and the Draco layer kept getting bigger and bigger. So basically, the Spectre team was canceled and laid off. And at that point, uh, Chris was determining, you know, it's going to be easier if we just write the entire engine ourselves and, 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 and do it the FileMaker way. Use the HBAM layer that uh, FileMaker was using before, update it. And it needed some changes from the, you know, the 88 version of it. But uh, this is when uh, that decision was made. Also during this time period is when Steve Jobs came back, and Claris was uh, basically uh, taken apart. Some parts went to Apple, some parts were uh, terminated, and all that was left was FileMaker, and we changed our name to FileMaker Inc. So this is the Draco team, the original Draco team. 
So there's still three of us here. John's in the middle. He was actually the manager of the Draco team at that point. Uh, Christopher Krim in red was kind of like the, the lead designer. I'm on the right there. Uh, Keith Proctor is still at the company. He actually gave a presentation at the DIG meeting and uh, at the, the Wedge uh, last week. So uh, these three people are still here. Actually, in this case, you know, both Keith and I wanted to be the skipper, but neither of us wanted to be Mary Ann. So we decided, okay, we'll have two skippers, and my ex-wife was Mary Ann instead. So that, that's how we uh, solved that problem. And then now we come up to, you know, the aught fours, I guess, uh, the start of the Draco-based products. So these are, 7.0 was the first time that the, the product was released based on top of the Draco engine itself. This thing, you know, has been, was in production quite some time, first as a little layer and then getting thicker and thicker underneath. So the APIs that were used on top of it could actually, you know, the, the FileMaker engine could use it pretty well. It's just that we kept, we, we basically started from the top down. It's kind of different than how like some database people work. They, they start from the bottom up, but we kind of started from the user interface and then decided what the engine should do based on the user interface as opposed to developing an engine and then try to figure out what type of interface to put on top of it. Um, something else to note is that, you know, this Draco engine was in production for quite some time, so it was actually designed for the hardware that was available in the 1990s. So actually when it comes out to, when you get up to FileMaker Pro 11 and when we came out with the first iOS version, FileMaker Go, uh, the hardware that was in the first iPhones are pretty much compatible to what the hardware was in the mid 90s. So the engine actually ran quite well on the phone. The, the, the main work on doing, coming up with the Go version of FileMaker was uh, doing the graphics because the imaging model, the, the windowing model and all that stuff is very drastically different between the, the Macintosh and the, uh, the iOS operating system. So that was basically the bulk of the work. I did stay, I, I pretty much stayed working on the Draco engine that time as Chris was doing the UI portions of it. And um, this is where other things other than just the engine uh, started causing problems because of the, the lifetime environment. And there's been some under the hood talks about how uh, the Go app has to be terminated uh, when other, you know, if you get a phone call and you're out of memory, the FileMaker is supposed to, the actual process gets terminated. So you have to save off all your state information and then come back to life when you come back to the foreground, which is something that the desktop products never actually have to do. So I spent most of my work dealing with those type issues. The, the engine as is ran pretty much well. It's just these other requirements that come from the iOS operating system to run underneath had to be worked on. And then now we come up to the design service. This is when the, the file, mark, file format changed uh, between 11 and 12. Up to this point, up through 11, we were still using that Mac draw style metaphor for you know, drawing layouts and for rendering and how the, the drawing system basically worked. It was still based in a, in a pretty ancient model. And uh, we knew we wanted to uh, improve instant web, pub or instant web publishing was getting long in the tooth. Um, you know, cascading style sheets was coming out as the main drawing mechanisms. People always wanted to be able to share styles between multiple objects. So this whole decision to redo the, the, the rendering engine and how we store layouts and all this stuff came up in the 12.0 timeframe. Now most of this work in the 12.0 timeframe was actually done only up in the app. It was actually done in the Draco layer. So it wasn't easily shareable between Go and the, the Mac and the WebDirect. And at this point, um, parts of it were taken in this part. But over these last few years and coming up now, we've been moving all the design surface layers down into the Draco engine so it can be shared between uh, other components and other products that we may be announcing. And, um, and actually, one of the, I guess the, the big reason is this big request that everyone's had you know, on WebDirect to be able to do PDF. And to be able to do render on the server, you basically have to move the rendering logic down into the Draco engine. Once it's down in the Draco engine, then we can now render PDFs anywhere. Anywhere that the Draco engine can run, we can now render PDFs. Oh, and the one last other thing that came out in the design service, which uh, is being talked about during this era, was the iOS app SDK. Uh, no, the FileMaker iOS SDK, that's the name of it, yeah. Uh, we always have the hardest problem naming projects at FileMaker, and that's the name that was picked. Or at least I think it's hard to pick names. Uh, so now I'll go through about what the, the different components of Draco, what makes up the Draco engine. At the lowest level is the, the, the support layer. Um, 
it's the, the platform agnostic. It, it knows how to do it. it the support layer has worked for 68K thousand base machines, PowerPC, Intel 32-bit, Intel 64-bit, ARM 6, ARM 7, ARM 7S, ARM 64 processors. Um, working on the Win, the Mac, uh, the iOS operating systems, and other operating systems that uh, we're going to be running on soon. This is the layer that hides all the file I.O., how threads are done, mutexing. Um, uh, cryptography, pretty much any low-level network operations all hidden there. So all the code that's written in C++ basically uses the objects in the support layer. So all the code above there doesn't need to worry about which platform you're running on. You, know, you just all write to the same API. Um, the, the, the string and text management and stuff is down in here too. Next is the, the, the HBAM layer that's on top of this. Now this is, this is kind of like what you consider like the oldest part of the Draco engine because this goes all the way back to 1988. This is the, the, the mechanism for how we store the, the FileMaker data into blocks on the file itself. Um, this engine has gone through many revisions. As I mentioned, it was first written in assembly, then I converted it to C, and then 7.0 it changed. And th this HBAM layer has been always kind of more tied to the file system. The, the first version of it was 512 byte blocks because that was the size of a block on a floppy drive. So when you were dealing with floppy drives, when you had your databases on those things, if anyone remembers that, uh, and swapping floppies in and out all the time. That was fun. Um, uh, you would read and write data in 5 to byte blocks. And then when the 3.0 FileMaker came out, the, the block size was bumped up, up to 1K. And in the 7.0 time frame, we went up to 4K because most disk subsystems at that point were reading uh, file uh, chunks of data in and out to the hardware in 4K chunks. Now that things are going to SSD and stuff like that, we, we probably should come back and revisit those uh, assumptions at this point because disk I.O. works very differently now in the modern OS's and how stuff works. But we're still sticking with the 4K blocks. Whenever we change this layer, this requires really a major file format change, so you probably don't want us to change this too drastically and, and quickly. The next layer above that is uh, what we call the, the DB engine layer. This is what you would think of the, the standard engine or the standard database engine. This is where the calculations are done, the networking is done, queries, uh, transaction handling is done. Now this is not a SQL database engine. We, our join graph is the, the mechanism that we determine where data is located. You don't do queries and like that. Now there's a little subsection of the, this engine layer, this DB engine layer, there's a little box, if we blew this out into a much bigger set of boxes of different components inside of it, there's a little box in there that you can take a SQL statement, pass it to it, and then it goes through all this conversion, splits it apart, tries to figure out and, and tries to map it into FileMaker or into the Draco DB engine calls, the, the binary calls that are located in there to do that. And then when it gets the data back, it needs to usually, hopefully it doesn't need to create a temporary file to store uh, the results coming back from the uh, SQL statement, but sometimes we have to create temporary tables and, and the, this is why um, uh, you know, the SQL APIs are never going to be as fat as, as the native APIs. Now, sometimes you know, there's certain operations that, you, that are hard to do using the FileMaker APIs going through the UI, and SQL is actually kind of faster just to, to get to that point, especially doing ad hoc queries and stuff like that where you don't want to use the join graph. Um, but I just wanted to make sure to, for people to understand that it's not a SQL, the, the, the engine is not natively a SQL database engine underneath it. So even when you're dealing with ESS, ESS is down in this layer too. It's actually taking the Draco operations and trying to uh, emulate the, the, the Draco APIs through the SQL database underneath it. And um, uh, that's why the, the performance sometimes isn't that great down in that layer too. The next layer above that is the design service. And this is the one that is actually even still in progress at this point. Um, this is the layer that knows how to render uh, layout data, uh, what views are, how to, if a mouse event occurs here, not that it actually got the mouse event, but if something called a mouse event occurred at this location, which object was hit, um, how to move that stuff and, and generate a PDF from it, and uh, basically, basically kind of like the drawing layer. Now the, the, the server version of the, the design service only knows how to generate PDFs. It doesn't know how to draw to other uh, platforms. And there's uh, extension mechanisms to the design service. So on Windows, it uses the Windows drawing APIs on Mac, the Mac APIs and iOS, similarly. 
this is also where we've uh, switched the, the PDF engine uh, from using DLI down to Hummus now. Um, and this is, was another requirement for us to do to, to, to bring PDF to the, the other platforms is that we needed to go to an, uh, a version of uh, the PDF generator that we, that we didn't have to pay a license for every potential web direct user that's out there. And then lastly, on top of this, of the, the Draco engine is uh, what we call the FM engine layer. This is actually where the layouts are stored and the scripts are stored in what we call the user model. The user model is uh, the, the, the environment that the scripting engine runs into. The, the Filemaker scripting engine is very uh, uh, context sensitive. You know, it, it, you say go to the next record, but you have to know well, what window are you talking about? What uh, layout are you on? What uh, record are you on? What is your found set? All that information is not specified. You don't pass that as a parameter into go to next record. You just say execute go to next record. So what I'm calling the user model is the state information of what the frontmost window is, what uh, the active uh, record is, what field is active, even where the insertion point is located. Because there's an insert, uh, 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 insert object script steps that can insert certain things at the, the um, insertion point. Now you don't have to look at all this stuff. Uh, this is kind of like a big layout. You can go download the PDF and look at this and look at all the little lines and see how things are all hooked up. But I mainly want to do the, 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 the top portion of the, the chart talks about all the different clients that we have, like ODBC, uh, PHP, XML, the ProGo clients, WebDirect, and stuff like that. The stuff under the line is all the stuff that's running inside the server. But what I really want to mainly highlight was where the Draco engine is located in all this stuff. Now the Draco engine isn't just atomic engine that everyone just talks to. The Draco engine is actually compiled into each of the clients. And into, in this case, you see the XDBC listener on the left side. The, the Pro and Go clients are both in the upper right hand corner. There's a standby server, there's a SASE, which is the server side scripting engine. When you do perform script on server or when you're scheduling scripts on the server, that's the process is actually running it. The CWPC handles both the XML requests and WebDirect requests. Actually, go, both go through that process. Now, all these boxes have their own copy of Draco. It's the exactly same copy of Draco. We don't compile one for clients and compile one for server. They're all exactly the same, and they all communicate back and forth using the, the GILP uh, protocol. These engines that are in all these different locations um, do a lot of work to determine whether it should, the work should be done on the client or the work should be done on the server. And we go through and we tweak that pretty regularly. You know, what's done where, what needs to be downloaded, and, um, and what happens there. Things get more complex because uh, the FileMaker Pro product uh, can actually talk to multiple servers at the same time. And this is something that I guess most databases probably don't do. You don't have one client that has one join graph that can span multiple servers completely different servers on different uh, machines. So the, the client actually has to have all the knowledge inside there to know, you know how to take this query and, and uh, split it into the different machines and then to join and combine the results back together once it comes back to the client. So next time we go on and talk a little bit of uh, how the operations work when you're inside the engine, how data is moved around, how data is stored kind of coming back to the whole HBAM. So I think HBAM stands for Hierarchical B-Tree Access Method is uh, what the name of it was for. And, and this is like what you see in a directory structure on your hard drive, how you, know, you have directories with subdirectories in it and then files underneath it, or you think of it as a tree. There's a bunch of different types of representations of that. So, the, the file, so when you get our document that describes the file format, what our file format basically is, is a, this big hierarchy. Uh, you can think of it as even an XML or a, or a JSON even. You could use that to represent it if you want, to represent it if you want. So there's branches and there's leaves of data. What HBAM does um, is basically you, you have this whole tree. You can ask for a specific branch or a specific leaf, and it knows how to find out what block that data is actually located on. So it's the thing that's managing this whole tree and then figuring out which blocks that data is actually located on. So most of the operations of the, the database engine really are just dealing with um, moving parts of the tree around. 
Like if you delete a record, it'll take a branch and just delete the branch and all the leaves that are and everything that's connected underneath it goes away. Um, if you're adding a record, it adds a branch. If, you're, uh, if a client is, wants to download a record, it takes a branch and downloads, takes that branch, packs it up over the network, ships it over, and then drops the branch into the temp file on the client. So when, you, when you, if you're working down in the, the, the engine layer, you know, you're, you're thinking about these key paths and, um, and chunks of data that are stored underneath it. So large chunks of data, like when you have a large container object, they're being split down into about roughly a, a thousand byte chunks. So the biggest leaf that we ever store is about a thousand bytes. So we have a, a standard uh, mechanism that we use throughout that if, you know, if an object is over a thousand bytes in size, instead of storing one leaf, it's then a, a branch of its own that has a whole bunch of leaves, one serially underneath it that are all 1K or 1,000 bytes in size going off along. This is to make sure that we can roughly fit about four leaves in every block and not have too much uh, extra space left over. So talking about extra space, I'm actually recycling slides back from presentations we, presentations we made back in 2007. I don't know if you remember this slide. But in addition, yeah, so in, in addition to this mapping that I'm talking about, it also manages the space in all these blocks. So it's watching when, if, if you try to insert a new leaf into a block, it may need to, need to split the block into two blocks. So it'll take that block, uh, duplicate it, uh, delete the upper half and the lower half on both sides and then insert the leaf into the, the block that it can fit in. Um, something that the original version, so uh, the, the encryptions of these blocks is something that's more recent when we added the encryption at rest. And that's actually handled by the HBAM layer too. So as each block comes in, it's uh, into memory, it's uh, decrypted. Now when these blocks are coming in and out of memory, uh, when you have the, the, the file cache settings that are in the pro product and the, the, the database uh, cache sizes that you can set in the server, what this cache is setting is, is storing how many of these blocks can be stored in memory at one point. So the, the cache isn't really based on records or anything like that. It's really based on the number of these blocks that you can keep in memory. Uh, when a block comes into memory, um, not only if it's encrypted, it has to be decrypted or encrypted when it comes in and out of memory. So if it can stay in memory, in memory all the time, it can stay decrypted, and you don't have to worry about you know, decrypting it every time you need to access that block. So that's one thing that uh, the cache helps in speed. Now with SSD drives out there and uh, much improved caching mechanisms by the operating system, the original reason was there was so that just to keep the block in memory because early uh, operating system cache managements were not that great, and it was better for us to cache the blocks instead of the operating system. That has changed a little bit, and you'll notice that sometimes you'll get better performance by decreasing the cache sizes in your server or your pro product when, if you're dealing with you know, very fast SSD drives. Or there are some people even that go out there and run on completely RAM drives for their FileMaker databases, but, and they want uh, you know, the absolute fastest performance. They go through and you know, spend wild amount of memory on it, but it is extremely fast. At that point, it's almost better just to leave the blocks on disk. And they're not encrypting, they're not doing EAR at that point because you know, they have enough money to build big guards and rooms and the things to protect it. But sometimes that this block just shows is that uh, the HBAM layer also manages the, the compression. So when you go through and you do save a copy and you go through and, and um, you know, uh, select a file and say, I'm gonna save a copy, I wanna compact it, it'll go through and move all the blocks around and move chunks and fit as much as it can into one block and go through and do that. Uh, it handles when the, the database, you know, delete large amounts of data. When you close the database is when all the free blocks that have no data in anymore all move to the end of the file, all the blocks are shuffled around, and then the file is truncated. And that's, that, that's actually the only time that a FileMaker file shrinks in size is at the close operation and after you've done a large delete. We don't, man we don't during idle time or something like that, keep moving blocks around to the end because there may be a free block in the middle of the file, but we may actually just refill it again as you insert more data. We don't really know until you close the file that you're actually really done with it, and at that point is when we clear up all the free blocks. Something else that the engine is managing all this time, we're getting a little bit higher level going up, uh, is that uh, we have these temporary files. So whenever, you, whenever the Draco engine opens up a main file, in this case in host, when it opens up file A, it creates a temp file for it. And this is true whether it's the, the host or the a local client either, uh, if you're just opening it up inside FileMaker on your local desktop. Uh, 
in the, in the network case, you actually have two temp files. The host has a temp file for that file, and the client actually has a temp file for that file. Actually, each client has a temp file for that file. And what we use these temp files for is basically when you, when you talk about caching. So this is why the, 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 the file block cache of HBAM is really different from what we, when you, when you hear people talking about caching records and stuff like that. When we're talking about that cache, we're talking about what's stored in the temporary file, not what's stored in memory. We're, we're, we're caching stuff in this temporary file. Uh, external container data or uh, thumbnail representations of these things, these things are not inside the file anymore. They're inside a folder that are next to it. And uh, on the client side, um, most operating systems have a cache folder, like where the browser puts cached files, where uh, other applications that are wanting to cache some data that it wants to build up, like uh, font images and stuff like that. Um, we use that same location, and we have a folder in there that will put uh, container objects that are externally stored where we'll download them from the host and put them into that folder so we can use them when we're displaying them. So when you're doing browsing operations, this is when uh, we start downloading records from the main file to the, to the client. And mainly at this point, we're moving it from the main file on the client, on the host, into the client's temporary file. As has been mentioned in previous talks and stuff like that, we, we work at the layer of records. We don't go down and just uh, pick specific fields to download based on the layout because uh, the complexity of that is we don't know when you're going to be switching layouts at any moment. There's calcs that are dependent on other fields. There's a whole bunch of sets of dependencies. So we stick to using the, 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 the native block of a record. It's also the, the locking mechanisms that are used in FileMaker for when you lock a record is basically based on the hierarchical tree. So our lock manager is just working off this tree. You say, I want to lock everything underneath this branch. I, um, so when you do a pause operation on side, on side server, what you're doing is saying that, oh, I want to block all writers in, uh, from the entire tree. So it puts a lock at the topmost part of the tree, or the, the, the root of the tree, depending which direction you like to think of things. Um, so records are locked that way. When you do table operations, we lock just the table and the, the entire hierarchy underneath that part. So we're downloading portions of these trees, as I mentioned, and in this case, entire records. Um, we, if something that is a little different is that the container fields, what's actually stored in the record is really just a pointer to what the container data is. There's a separate uh, library that stores the actual container data. And we go through and we, uh, we consolidate. If, there, if you insert the same container data into multiple fields, we just basically ref count the first one multiple times. So if, and we've been doing this for a long time because in the, especially when you were dealing with like the earlier versions of FileMaker, this, this logic goes back to like the 3.0 time frame. Uh, because you know, people would be doing these green light, red light things on each record and stuff like that. And you know, when you only had a 20 megabyte hard drive, you know, 10,000 green lights and red lights would burn up most of your hard drive for that. So that was basically a big feature of FileMaker back then is that we, you know, we consolidated all these things down into, uh, uh, into one entry into the library and with a ref count of like you know, maybe two and a half million versus three red lights or something like that. Something else is when the client is asking for stuff, when you're asking for external data, or actually asking for containers in, in general, um, the, the view system now can ask for an image of a specific size if it knows it's just gonna render it. And in that case, when the request goes up to the host, the host will generate a thumbnail of that image instead of uh, downloading the entire you know, three megabyte TIFF or whatever it is. It'll just download you know, uh, you know, a couple K uh, ping of it or something like that, which will then get stored in the local cache too whenever it needs to reference it. But when you do operations like you know, uh, uh, export uh, field to disk or something like that, at that point, then we do have to download the entire TIFF, you know, the, the, the full-size object, to uh, put it on the hard drive for you. So in this case, you know, we've been talking about how you know, the client keeps pulling things from the host. There is one case where the host actually pulls something from the client. When we're doing queries, um, and you do an unstored query, uh, that, this could be almost just a whole talk of how the query manager works. But 
some queries can act, usually we try to push the query right to the host to do the query there. So you can use the indexes and, and you know, reference a bunch of records and do that type work. Um, so if the query, if the unstored calc contains a global field in it, uh, but the host would go through and ask the client, well, send me all your global fields at this moment because I need them because to do, to do the operation and to evaluate those calculations on my server side, it needs the, the values of those globals. Something that's new in 15 is that before 15, um, uh, some people were noticing that we weren't uploading variables to the server. So if you were doing queries on unstored calcs and then the client decided to say, oh, I think we can do this on the server side, uh, the query would return an, uh, an answer that you weren't expecting. Or well, the answer would be always the answer you would get if the variable was empty. So that is actually something that's new to 15 and changed that. Uh, you can now use variables in your uh, unstored calcs and your query should always work depending on whether it decides to uh, perform the query on the client or on the server. So you know, I've been talking about all this data going up and down and we still haven't really talked about what is that temp file on the host for? The temp file on the host is for up, uh, when changes are made on the client. And this is not even actually just for record data. This could be if you change a layout, if you make a change to a theme, if you, you know, update a value list or something like this. Pretty much every, everything works in this kind of mechanism. Is that what happens is that uh, when you're editing the layout or you're editing the value list or you're editing the record, you're editing the copy that's in the, the local temp file, the temp file A on the client. And once you finish editing it and you say, you know, hit the OK button, in like uh, define value lists or you know say save and layout mode or whatever like that. We upload the object that you're editing and we uploaded it to the temp file that the server has for that file. It's uploaded to the same exact location. The, 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 how the tree looks on all these temp files almost look identical to each location. So it says take this branch and put it in the same exact location on the host. So it goes up to the host that way. Once all the different components of the layout or the, the database schema or the or the multiple records, you can, be, uh, manage, you can be changing multiple records within one transaction. All those records are uploaded to their proper locations in the temp files. And maybe different temp files if, you're, if your uh, related data happens to be in other files. They all get uploaded to the temp file. And then a final command is sent up to the host saying, okay, now commit this, uh, commit this data. Um, and at that point, then the server takes, looks in the temp file, moves everything into the main file, does whatever, whatever other processing has to be done, like indexing, um, uh, clean up all the indexes, and uh, go through and send the notifications out to all the clients. We mainly do this uh, so that if there's a network uh, uh, break during the time that we're uploading the data that we don't mess up the main file. And this actually, even, even in version seven, when we, this is something that changed as we were going through, and I think it was finally completed around the, the version 10 version of FileMaker, some operations were actually just moving things directly to the main file, uh, even, even in the 7.0 time period. So that's why there was some, you know, some people were complaining about instability and were afraid of doing uh, editing stuff on the, the clients back then. Because if the network did go down, you could screw up your layout and stuff like that. But over the time, we've been going through and making sure that everything goes through this process. It does slow down, you know, making the changes, but you know, it, it's a lot more safer. And if your network goes down during this part of the process, you don't want your data corrupted in the main file. A few more facts about temporary files. Um, they're always encrypted. The level of encryption is based on the main file's encryption. Um, if you're using EAR and it's AES-256 encrypted, the temp file will be encrypted using the same scheme. Even if the main file is not encrypted, uh, we do do a light level of encryption that's pretty fast, and it's, you can kind of consider it instead of 256, 256 bit encryption, it's really only 32 bit encryption. So it is much smaller, but it is still encrypted. You can't just take the file and, uh, and look at it. You'd have to go through and, you know, and instead of taking years to break it, you know, maybe it'll just take a month or so or something like that for your temp file. If you really want the security, make sure you go through and use the EAR encryption. Um, Network files that are uh, temp files that we keep around now uh, with the cache data, we keep for 15 days. We keep them in the cache location that your operating system provides for uh, applications. If it's a temp file that's created for a local file, we delete it immediately uh, because we can just pull the data back over from the main file for when you're doing editing and stuff like that. 
If the free space disk, if the free disk space on the main drive where the temp files are located gets under 250 megabytes, we'll start purging these things, unused cache files. Uh, we'll even start going through and start deleting data that's in the temp file cached records. We'll start uh, deleting that data and, uh, and removing it to make up so that we have some free, uh, free space available inside the temp file. Uh, external container data is a little bit different. Those files are being cached in a folder inside the cache location on your hard drive. And there we, uh, we're a little bit more uh, stingy on the amount of space, disk space we'll use for that. So if you have less than two gigabytes available on the Mac or Windows, or one gigabyte available on an iOS device, we'll only, uh, we'll only keep the, the layout or the container objects that are actually in use. And otherwise we'll start purging the, the one that was used the longest or last, or the oldest referenced one. So a little, I guess, performance tip. If you really want FileMaker to work the best, if, if you're not dealing with container data at all or external container data, you just need about 250 megabytes free. But if you're dealing with external container data, you really want to have about two gig available on the main drive, where, wherever your main drive. And, and when I'm talking about main drive, this is the drive where the operating system says to store temporary files and cached files. So wherever you know, your browser that you're using stores its GIFs and stuff like that, that it's going to reuse over and over time. It's usually the C drive on Windows and the main drive on Mac, but there's a bunch of different ways you can configure things to move that uh, folder to different locations. Next, I'm going to go over the, the file opening process. One reason why I'm talking about this is that last year, uh, this was a question that came up on a panel that I was at. And I went through and gave like a, a minute and a half answer on this thing. And people were scrambling things and writing stuff down as fast as I could. And everyone came back and said, you know, can, you, can you please go over this slower and you know, go into more detail of what's going on? So it's, it's a seven step process. Um, you couldn't figure out enough to get up to like a 12 step or you know, some other fancy number. But. So the first part is a path list processing, step one. In FileMaker, when you define a file to open, um, and, and actually even the scripting stuff to do import and export and stuff like that, you can specify a number of paths. It's not, you don't necessarily have to put one path in there. I don't know how many people, you know, some people just go in there and hit the add file and they see that one bit of string and hit okay and go away. But actually, FileMaker is a little bit more flexible in there is that you can put multiple paths in there and it'll resolve until it finds the first one it can use and then use that one to open the file or use that location to store the external file. So you can, if you know, if you, you, know, you want to have it stored in one place on Windows and one place on Mac and maybe on a, uh, and whenever you run that script, you can actually put those two paths in there and it'll use the first one it can find. Um, and also, this is where you can put in local variables and. Uh, uh, global variables into it. You can use the dollar, dollar, and dollar variables in there. You can use that as a representation of what to use. Uh, so what the, the path list processing, what it does at this point, it goes through, it looks at the list of files that you have there. It'll, it'll replace the global variables with whatever, whatever the variable value is at that point, turn relative paths into full paths based on whatever file is kind of the parent file that is driving that process. And then it removes paths paths that are not valid for that platform. Now, things like the replacing of local and global variables isn't necessarily done in all the processes. The, the, the key part here, and the, the, one of the big requests I keep hearing again, is that people want to use variables inside uh, uh, external um, data sources. So when you reference another file in the join graph, they want to put a variable in there. there there's some problems with that right now, that the, the variables aren't even known at that point when we're processing stuff. And, We've been having discussions with other developers about maybe different techniques we can use and, and ways to uh, maybe improve this in the future. But as an example, so here's an example with a four-line uh, path list. And um, this, is, this script is in a file called invoices.fmp5. So I have a relative path first. I have a variable as the second uh, choice to go through. And then a, a file win, so that path should only be ever resolved on a Windows machine. And the last one should ever only be resolved on a Mac machine. And after we go through that processing that I mentioned, if, the, if we're on a Mac and the, the, I, the $IT variable contained uh, that FM net path, then we end up with a different path list that's fully resolved, going down to file colon with the absolute path, the absolute FM net path, and the, the last path there. 
So now we get to step two. Now we have this nice path list. Now we need to find the file. So steps two, we start walking through that list of files. The first thing is to check, is that file already open? If it is, then we're all done. There's nothing else to do. We, we, we're all happy and we can stop all this opening process. We, we just use the one we have. For the FMNet paths, uh, the first thing we do is see if we already have a connection to that host. The, how the GLP protocol works that, talk, that we're using that talks between multiple database engines that I pointed out in that graph some time back can multiplex multiple calls over the same pipe. It's not like HTTP where you send a request and you wait for a response on that one pipe. You can send multiple requests over it and then and the, the order of the request and the responses coming back and forth can be intermingled in any way over that one pipe. So we look to see if we already have a connection to the host. If we have that, we're going to use that one. If we don't have it, then we open up a connection to that host. And this is just opening a connection to the host. It's not logging into the host or anything like that. It's just opening a pipe up to the host so we can make additional uh, queries to it. Uh, step C, then we try to open the file. We try to open it read-write first. If that fails, then we try a second time asking for read-only. And this can happen over the network if you know you, you get your permissions wrong, or actually if you do want to have your file read-only on the host, you can do that, and uh, we'll only open it read-only. But we actually go through and actually open, try to open it twice. And if, if you go through and you see, like when John starts showing some of his, his stuff, you will may see two open calls coming through if you're opening read files and stuff like that. And that's the reason. We always go through and try the read-write first and then read second. And that's a small performance hit sometimes, and it hasn't been decided worth enough to actually make that change. And there's actually a lot of stuff that have to change to change that. But if that path, that, that one path that we're trying to process, if none of that works, then we go through and then try the second item in the path and then the third, and we continue going on. So next we come to step three, the change that's changed the most uh, in the last release. And if you were uh, following any of my uh, social media stuff, you'll keep saying that. I was saying, you know, I'm going to talk about the mysterious step 3B. And I just didn't really put enough in it, effort into that. And I have to really thank Beatrice for being the, the, the one person that, you know, thank you for uh, <laughs> kind of following along. And <laughs> thanks. Um, actually, Kent from New Zealand helped a little bit too. But uh, for, for step A, uh, you know, we will either, we, we determine the path of the temporary file that we create. If it's, is it, if it's going to just be a local path or a local temp file that we're going to throw away, we just pick a random name that we're going to use. If it's one that, uh, if it's a file that we're opening up over the network, we use the, the name of the file, the name of the host, and the path of where the client is stored to generate a, a supposedly unique path for where the cache file should be stored. Now, we've been hearing some issues from some customers here that I guess they're hitting some conflicts where this is not being is this is not being unique enough for some reason when they're running server and client on the same machine. And we're still researching this issue of what's going on with that case. But we're, we're going to figure out what's happening with that. But um, it's supposed to be a unique name for that file host and client. So I, I don't know why that's failing for some reason. Then we get to the new step 3B. Uh, um, this is where we'll actually reuse the file. And this is the new thing that helps performance. I mean, Richard Carlton has been like, yelling, saying, oh, that file maker is so great now, how fast it opens files. And it actually does work quite a bit. I mean, if there, there's no reason to re-download the layouts and the records into the cache file if they've never changed. And this is really not even that new of a concept, because uh, as I was talking back, when I was working on FileMaker Go, we had to keep around that temp file and all that state information anyway when the app was unloaded and brought back in. So this logic and this mechanism um, had to be tweaked a bit because uh, it's not exactly the same thing going on. But uh, the general mechanism we knew was working because it was working in Go. Actually, what we did is we, we found out there were some bugs in Go that no one's noticed and when we put it into the mainline product. So we fixed Go now, so it's working even much better, even though we never got any reports about it. But it's working much better in 15, so yeah, upgrade. Um, and so when we, we, we use that temp file, then the, the, the step C is where we go through and um, determine if any data is out of date. So you'll see a, a remote call, um, when you, especially if you use top, um, uh, top call logging. OK, OK. Go see John's talk tomorrow morning. He, he's going to go into a lot more detail about that. Uh, but you, you'll see this call you know, saying, you know, uh, 
I'm not even sure what the name of it is, but uh, we go through and we send up a, a, a list of all the modified objects, or all the objects that are in the cache file. Uh, we send that up to the host, and the host goes through and checks to see, oh, okay, these are all these branches and leaves. Is the modification ID for all these leaves still valid? If they match, it just deletes them from that, and then it sends back a report of all the ones that are different. So then the client gets a list of all these leaves and branches that are in the temp file that are out of date, and it just goes through and just trims them all. So it doesn't even know whether it's a record or a layout or anything like that. This is really kind of at a lower level. It just knows that this, these, these portions of the tree that are stored in the temp file are out of date, and we need to delete them. So it goes through, deletes all that stuff. So when the client opens a file and it needs to access that layout, which got deleted because it was out of date, it'll just download it again, or download the record again if it's not there. And uh, some other little information comes down into the temp file. There's, there's some versioning data to keep track of what versions of Homemaker and what, what you've set for what the minimum operating versions are, the window locations, auto login information that may be needed, whether we show the guest checkbox is enabled or disabled in the login dialog box that's coming up. And then the, the login process. This is a pretty complex series of events, too. We'll try to, if you're reconnecting, like if the network went down and you're trying to reconnect, we're going to try to use the old credentials. Um, step B is uh, trying the account and password for the like, entire session. And, and certain clients have more of these session-based things. And the, the, base, the biggest example of that is ODBC. Because in ODBC, you log in with a username and password. And you're going to use that username and password for every file that you open. So that's what step B is, is handling that case where whatever the client is, is going to try to use the same username and password for every file. If that's not there, uh, the third thing that we try is the parent's file credentials. You know, if this file is opening that file, we'll try the same credentials there. So we're basically passing the credentials down and trying to reuse it for the next file you're opening. If that doesn't work, then the auto login credentials, the ones that you may have set in the file options. Uh, on Windows, there's single sign-on at that point. If your server is also running on Windows and you have it hooked up to the Active Directory, we'll try to use the single sign-on logic that the, the client's Windows machine, if they're on the same domain, will go through and use that and try to log in for external authentication. Next, the keychain or the credential manager, if you're using that, if uh, you've uh, enabled that. I think by default now, the keychain is turned off in any new file that you create. Uh, so you actually have to turn that on to see this feature now. Uh, Next, we handled expired password cases. We may need to go through and change the password because it's been expired. And then only if all these cases fail do we then actually go through and uh, ask the user and bring up the login dialog box to actually ask for the username and password. Next is the database engine processing, step five. This is where we go through and there's a minimal amount of stuff that we need to download. Uh, we need to know what all the schema is, basically, the, the tables, the table occurrences, the relationships that are all between there. And step B is uh, where we actually merge all this stuff together. And we get questions um, often saying, well, if I have this big join graph, is this, is, is this really a slow operation, or you know, how does the size of the join graph affect operations and stuff like that? Um, loading in one join graph into memory for one single file is really a pretty fast operation. It says, oh, okay, here's the join graph. We dump it into this global map. Because the database engine has this one map of all the files and how they're all interrelated to each other. Where you'll start running into the slowdown is if you start opening up multiple files that all have massive join graphs that all interact, interact with each other. Because things that the, this master map is keeping track of is which tables need to be modified for cascading delete. If you delete a table, or if you delete a row in this table, you know, what are all the other tables that need to be modified and objects need to be deleted in there? Uh, there's uh, dependency information about uh, 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 portal row creation and stuff like that. What happens, what are the, all the intermediate paths? What may have to be affected and what may, uh, primary keys may need to be generated for doing the, the automatic uh, uh, record creation that we do uh, inside portals. So, if you have a file with one big join graph and then all the other files have real tiny join graphs that aren't really that drastically interconnected, that really shouldn't slow things down too much. But you really run into the more of the performance problems if you have massive old files with these big join graphs and you all open them at the same time. And, and, and really the, the, the worst thing was if you were just converting pre-70 files, which 
basically had these big star join graphs and you'd have you know, 15 star join graphs that all had to get merged and you have to go through and follow the paths through all the possible uh, mechanisms to get that hooked up. Now if you're doing uh, some of the, the simpler clients like ODBC or even uh, a server-side scripting, basically the process of the opening process ends at this point. Because those guys, uh, um, actually no, server-side scripting doesn't stop at this point. ODBC is the best example of that because you can't run scripts inside server-side scripting. I mean, in, in ODBC, sorry, getting a little mixed up. So we get to step seven, which is the, uh, step, step six, the FileMaker engine processing. This is where uh, the, the user model that I talked about in the FM engine layer, uh, it wants to have a window for this file usually uh, if you're doing the opening. Um, even if it's on server-side scripting, uh, there is a virtual window that's being constructed there at that point. Um, if it's a remote, remote file, we start downloading this stuff. This is when we start downloading the, the layout, the style sheets, uh, value lists, uh, font ID mapping. We have a little uh, structure inside each file because when we store uh, data and their style runs inside of it. We don't store the name of the text of the font for every style run that's inside data that's stored throughout the tables. Each uh, style run has this ID number and then there's this big table that maps all these IDs to font names. And uh, this is a chunk of data that it comes down and it should come down once and then uh, this is something that could slow down your system too. When this font table comes down, we try to go through and resolve which font we'll actually use for those IDs at that point. So if you have a file that's been used I mean, we have some files that go way back at FileMaker where we're using, you know, you see font entries in here for like Monaco and Chicago and, you know, ancient Mac fonts that, you know, no longer exist. But we still have to go through and process that and determine which font we're going to use if we come across one, of, if you display that data using that reference. And also custom menus come down. At this point, we also queue up any script triggers that, that are based off the opening of the, the window that will add. Um, to the queue for things to execute once we get to uh, some idle time. And lastly is what happens after this opening process. Then the operating system is going to probably most likely ask to, you know, draw this window. Uh, and we're waiting for the next idle event to come through to run the scripts because basically scripts are run when no other events are coming in from the operating system. And then in the remote case, when after you'd open the file, this is where the, the view system, when it's going through and starts saying, oh, I want to draw this layout. Oh, I need data from this record. Oh, I need data from that record. I need this portal. I need this. This is when the requests start coming in to download this stuff. And for record data, sometimes uh, we, we usually go through and try to prefetch stuff uh, more often. Like I believe we'll prefetch like the next 20 records from the one you're currently viewing, assuming that you're going to be going forward. So it's not necessarily we're downloading one record all the time. If you're in view as list mode or you have portals, we'll go through and download uh, records that, are, that span both sides of what's currently being viewed. Uh, so as you start scrolling that, we have some of the record data downloaded already. Uh, we'll be downloading scripts as they're being executed and we download container data when needed. Next, uh, so the last part I'm gonna talk about some of the changes that were made for uh, FileMaker uh, 15 in particular. So this is a little chart that I made for using how the, the, the magical step 3B uh, where uh, we're caching the data. Now even, even as you go down the chart here, we're always making performance improvements to the FileMaker engine. It's, it's not just that we decided just at this point to do that point. You can see from this graph where I did this with a, a downloadable solution, a, a common uh, template that people start their solutions from that are on the internet. And uh, I ran it on 12, 13, 14, and 15, going through the uh, loopback interface, which is basically having the machine and the client on the same one, and then using the Mac uh, line conditioner software to simulate Wi-Fi, DSL, and 3G. So this is all a very controlled environment because it wasn't really using a real network. It was using the, the and these are handy tools to use to play around with if you want to see how your uh, uh, solution will operate on uh, specific environments. But as you see, the, the 3G, or basically the, the, the WAN case, improves drastically when you go through and you have the, the layout and the record data already in the cache file to, to open them. <laughs> the next uh, change, uh, there, there's a new script step that was added called truncate table in 15. Uh, you can go through and, and it'll just basically delete all the contents in there, uh, 
not doing any cascading delete. It's a very fast way if you just want to get rid of the, all the data in the table immediately. Now, one reason why delete all records what you can use is slow is that there's a lot of work that has to do when you're deleting records in general. When the delete records is walking through all the records, and there's that arrow that I'm pointing going down. It goes through, it needs to check to see if you have permissions to delete the record. It needs to know whether you have cascading delete operations on that record. It needs to know whether someone else is using that record and it can be deleted. So there's a lot of checking that goes along in there. And then also whether there's container data that's in that record and then go back and see what the reference count in the container store area where the actual container objects are stored, see what the reference count is on that thing and see if it's going to go to zero or not. So when you're going through and you're doing delete all records, the delete all record command will go through and uh, do this in chunks of 500 records at a time. And that's why it's pretty slow. But after we implemented the truncate table, you know, some people say, well, why don't we just use the truncate table ta in that case? Because in that case, all we do is we just throw away, you know, when I'm talking about this whole tree thing is, you know, when you're doing delete all records all the way, you're going through and deleting all these little branches individually. But if we're doing the truncate table, basically just chops two branches, the branch that contains all the container data and the branch that contains all the record data. And it's a lot quicker. But to do this, to be able to use the truncate command instead of the delete all command, uh, we have A through G of all the things that have to be true. Now, it, it does manage that this hap actually happens pretty regularly if you have the full found set selected. Um, it can go through and actually use the truncate table. So even though there's all these conditions here, it's not that rare of a thing that we, you know, that we will use truncate. It, it actually happens pretty common in the solutions that we've seen. So one thing is that the, the, the version has to be 15 and it has to match the host. The second one is it only works on FileMaker tables and not ODBC EESS tables, shadow tables. You have to be trying to delete all the records, not just the subset. But then the command says delete found records instead of delete all records um, in the menu if you look at it at that point. The user has to have permissions to delete all the records and there can't be any uh, calculations determining whether that user has delete permissions or not. There can't be any uh, cascading delete operations in any table or in any file that would be, uh, have to be handled if you deleted that record. Uh, the truncate table ignores that restriction. If you, if you tell the script step to do truncate table, it doesn't care about cascade deletes. It assumes that you know what you're doing. And you need actually full admin permissions to perform that script step anyway. Uh, but when we're doing delete all records, uh, we don't want to skip you know, uh, your, your integrity of your database by skipping not deleting your uh, invoices based off your uh, or line items for your invoices. There can't be any global container fields. Um, this is because where um, global fields store their containers is in the same library object where all records store its containers too. So we're going to blow away the entire container library, but we don't want to blow away container data that's in your global fields. And we don't actually uh, delete the, the container, uh, I mean the global fields either. And the last thing is that we have to get a lock on all the records. This may be the more likely one to fail in the multi-user case. If this, a user is editing one record in that uh, database, um, then we'll go through and start deleting one record at a time. And hopefully, and that's one of the bad things about delete all records is it doesn't necessarily guarantee that you're going to delete all the records if one user is using that record. Um, and this is where you may want to design things and maybe use truncate table if you can, because truncate table will succeed or fail. It doesn't fail halfway or anything like that. It's, it's going to delete everything if it succeeds. Um, another big change in the Draco engine is going through is that we're, we're trying to make the client a lot more multi-threaded. I mean, this started first uh, with container field loading. Um, you, you've, I forget which version this went into. They're kind of becoming a blur now. We're going so fast of a release cycle. Um, but in this case, we've uh, when you, when you have a container object on there and you're over the host, we would spawn another thread to actually fetch the data, which may be fetching the data over the network over the host or waiting for the host to generate the thumbnail. Or even in the local case, if there was like a five um, megabyte uh, TIFF and we wanted to generate a thumbnail for that container uh, to actually display, uh, we'll actually do generate that thumbnail on a different thread, even in the local case, and then cache that thumbnail the next time you draw it again to make it faster. So this was our, our first foray into doing uh, multi-threaded drawing. But the new feature in 15 that we have is doing the portal inline progress bar is what they call it. And it's basically a similar process that we did for uh, container data. 
and uh, uh, we'll go through and, and to generate the, the rows that are in a portal, there's, you have to do a query. Uh, you may have to do filtering, you know, if you have a portal filtering turned on or if you have filtering of uh, uh, authentication information, you may have to sort it uh, if you have your portal sorting on or the relationship is sorting. There's a bunch of different operations that can take a while to generate that portal list. So basically the same as what we did for uh, uh, container objects, we now do for generating the list of records that are in the portal. This is actually not the fetching of the data in the portal. This is just generating the list of rows that need to be displayed in that portal. The, the fetching of it works can, the, the way it used to, where it goes through and it'll start downloading records and fetch and stuff there. Um, one big change that we've heard some developers going through and, and promoting these techniques of, oh, you can set a, a, a variable with a let statement in a, a uh, calculation that's based on some object that's off the screen but in the background, and then you can use that variable in all these other locations and stuff like that. You really don't want to do this type of operations anymore in FileMaker because we're not gonna, we don't guarantee what order we're going to actually draw and render data that's on the layout object, or in, in the layout in general. Um, like one technique I used to use to determine how fast a layout took to draw is that the, ba the, the object in the, the back would set a variable for the current time, and then the topmost object would then read that variable and then subtract it from the current time and say, well, that's how long it, it took to draw the layout. That no longer works now with uh, these multi-threading things. If you have a portal on there, it's going to come back, and if the portal's the only thing there, it's going to say, oh, it drew in like 0.1 milliseconds, even though you know, the thing is still spinning in the middle. So any of these tricks where you're using setting variables inside layout objects and then trying to use that variable inside some other layout object, or any assumption, you really can't make the assumption at what point that layout object is going to, that variable is going to be set in some let statement. Now, if, you, if you're setting variables inside uh, things like script steps and stuff like that, scripting is still all single-threaded. We're not going to go through and start executing script steps in random orders and stuff like that. Um, <laughs> that's, we don't want to give you the headaches of multi-threading that we have to deal with internally. But, you know, people have always asked, you know, you know why, you know, I have a four-core client, you know, why is drawing only using one core? So we're, we're actually going through and changing that now. We are going to start using more processors to do the drawing and to speed up the drawing. But that does break this one assumption that some people have been depending on. And proactive security warnings, that's another thing that came in. Um, it did cause, it's not terribly interesting. I mean, you get this stuff now, but it did cause some, uh, a bunch of changes in the Draco engine. Because these errors that come from SSL occur way deep down inside open source libraries that were, you know, there's multiple layers of FileMaker logic on it. And we had to come up with a scheme to be able to get these errors back from these lower levels and to get the text of the, the type of errors and the, and, the, and the actual certificate so we could display them to you. So that actually took a, a chunk of work to actually get done through the Draco engine to, to transmit all this information up, actually even when you're dealing with the multiple threads, because you may be, a portal may be causing a new connection to be opened up to another server which may have a bad certificate. So that, that certificate error may be occurring on a different thread than the main thread, so we can't have, and the OSs nowadays don't like doing GUI work on anything other than the main thread, so we have to be able to send messages back to the main thread to display these errors and, and handle all these cases. So tomorrow, and then there's some more server changes that have been done, and so this is the ad for uh, John's session tomorrow morning. Um, he, he's going to go through a lot more practical applications of things that you can do to actually improve the speed of your, of your solutions and, and, and the, the new tools that are in server to, that you can look at to uh, uh, help you manage that and things you can do. I, I recommend going to that session. Um, I will put the updated uh, slides up on the, the, the website so you can see the, all those big long lists and you can take a good look at that uh, big uh, graph of all the objects that are in the server and then the clients. So we have uh, some time left for questions. And uh, please go to the mic so it can get recorded if you have any questions to ask. Sure. I have a question about the portal progress bar. Yes. Um, run into a situation where the portal loads extremely quickly so you don't see the bar. 
but then the interface does freeze and it seems to be when there's an unstored calc in the portal. So is the inline progress bar not for unstored calcs? Does it? Yeah, the, 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 what's being done on the opposite thread is getting the list of records, not actually yeah. what's in the contents of those records that you're displaying. Okay. So once the record is, de once it is determined that we need to dis display this record from that table, uh, then we're back on the main thread. And when the main thread comes along and says, oh, there's this unstored calc, then it evaluates that calc at that moment. Now, now we are thinking about maybe start performing unstored calcs on other threads. And this is going to really make it wacky what order unstored calcs would be occurring. So really don't, you know, you'll really have no idea of what order calcs are going to be performed in once we start doing that type of work. But we are moving that way. More work on more threads. But we're, we're, we're doing like one step at a time and one type of things. Uh, that's not going to be the next one on the list of things to do. But it is in the plan of things to make more multi-threaded. Great. Thanks. Um, I think you're at the one in the back next. Um, with the use of the, the new temp file, uh, how will that, will that still be used if uh, somebody's in a Citrix-like environment where people are creating sessions in a Citrix environment and then logging off and then a new user's coming in? I guess the temp file wouldn't, wouldn't be resident in that case. I believe most Citrix systems go through and end up deleting most of those caches and stuff like that as you switch between users and stuff like that, so they won't be... Uh, yes. Well, the opening wouldn't be any faster in a Citrix environment, probably. No, it won't be. So hopefully, if your Citrix machine is running on the, you know, very close to your server, you're getting good performance in that case anyway. So it really shouldn't hurt you too much in that case. Up here in the front. So I have two questions, and one of them is Citrix. Um, I noticed that in FileMaker 15 files, uh, FileMaker launching, not just a file opening, but the app launching is significantly faster. Um, do you know of any improvements that were made specifically for that? Yeah, this, this goes along, I guess this is kind of the theme of doing multi-threading. Uh, we, we noticed that there are some things that are done all the time. Like one of the things is going through and finding out what all the fonts are on the system. You, you can see this in Word sometimes. You'll see it going through. You see all the font names flowing by on the uh, splash screen and stuff like that. Uh, and we were basically doing the same type of operation too. But what we do now is that we actually spawn a thread at launch time that goes through font processing. And uh, some people would notice if you have a large number of fonts installed in your machine, you would get a pretty slow launch time at that point. But now we go through and we're, we're going through and processing all the fonts and building up our structures of what are needed to prepare for the mapping when you open the file to map all these numbers from one number to the other. Um, and we go through and we start doing building that thing because there is a lot of other stuff we can do at that same time. But the minute the first draw operation goes through and wants to do the first font mapping, those threads are going to wait until that one finishes doing all the font processing. But typically, there's a much other, going through that whole opening process, there's quite a bit of stuff that needs to be done before you even get to the point that you need to figure out which font to draw. So most of the time, that thread is done before then. So then the other question that I have is, um, why, what would, is it a, a big technical challenge on macOS to have single sign-on with Kerberos? Um, I guess as you've heard in the opening session, we're going to be going down the OAuth mechanism. So then the actual mechanism being used behind whatever authentication method you're going to use could be using Kerberos in the back end. But we're going to uh, basically work behind that platform and let you use you know, whatever uh, biometric or whatever mechanism that OAuth wants to use to do that. That's where we're going in that direction. Thank you. Thanks in the back there. Uh, <clears throat> Clay, is, uh, when you mentioned that you uh, write out the, uh, the script and the layout and the changes, like, and you move it up to the server and then you write it out to the server, would there be any, any chance of also writing out who made that change so that, you know, like someone made a modification to a script, we could actually see it in the script, like who last modified this script or layout or... That, that kind yeah, of thing. Yeah, that's always possible. Yeah. That's, yeah. <laughs> and, and, and a secondary follow-up question is, uh, at WWDC, Apple announced changes to the OS and, and in terms of uh, how they're going to, I forget what, what it is exactly, but it, it affects kind of the, uh, the OS at a lower level, kind of how those blocks are written. Um, I noticed you mentioned, you know, um, at some point, th this stuff will, you know, needs to be updated. Hmm. I, I wonder if you, you have any thoughts there about that. They did announce that. a new file system. Yeah, um, but it's not going to come for a while, but it's just yeah. starting to... 
Yeah, the, the, the big problem right now we see with that new file system is that it's currently uh, case sensitive and most Windows and Mac users haven't dealt with case sensitive uh. operating systems before. Linux based people have been dealing with case sensitive stuff a lot. Mm. Um, and I'm not quite sure if we're going to, if we have to start working on a case sensitive system with a, a client side, whether we're going to have to try to hide the, you know, the, the differences when you're dealing with those two systems or, you know, which version of the name we're going to show. So there is some work that we have to start thinking about if the issue that you're talking about with the, the new file system. Yeah. But Apple may change their mind and make it a, a case insensitive system at the last moment too. It's, it's hard to predict what Apple's going to do. Okay. Yeah, front here. I'm going to try for uh, I'm going to try for three quick ones. Uh, if you were building a new solution today uh, that had about 100 tables, would you put that in one file, or would you recommend not doing that? Um, uh, uh, I'm trying to keep the file sizes reasonably. I mean, if there are 100 tables that are tiny tables and stuff like that, I'd throw them all into one file. But you know, I start getting a little bit worried when you know one file gets over. A gigabyte in size and stuff like that. You know, I may, I may start splitting up some stuff. And you know, if there's one table that has you know multiple gigabytes or whatever that person, I forgot who did it, that has a two billion record database now that they're playing around with. And it's kind of interesting to see where we we start breaking down at that point. Or yeah, um, so it's it's really more I think the, the what I would call reasonable size of the data as opposed to just the number of tables and stuff yeah, like okay. that. Uh, next one is uh, now that you've figured out the logic for scripts to run on the server all the time for WebDirect, do you foresee a time when Pro will do that as well? There's a lot of state information. You know, when I, you know, the, it's where that user model is running that determines where you can run the script. And the user model is actually running on the server. The user model doesn't run in the browser. So that's why the scripts are running there. Uh, there's a lot of state information that's determining like where window locations are, what windows the most foreground and stuff. And trying to keep that information in sync between both the server and the client would probably generate a lot more traffic than you would save by doing the work over there to keep track of, okay, well, you know, did the window order change during the middle of the execution of the script and when the script paused here? And really, yeah. the, the script runs where the user model is. Gotcha. The new temp files, are they in a kind of obvious place? Yeah, if you go into wherever the, your, your typical caches folder is on your operating system, you'll see like a FileMaker folder and you'll see three folders in there. One like for data, one for thumbnails, one, and stuff like that. Yeah, no, it's only the front. Uh, from a virus scanning standpoint, is there some documentation as to where all of them are located so we can put them in the virus scanning uh, defaults to not scan? Um, just look at, for, for temp files and cache files, the operating systems tend to have, uh, I think on Windows what you do, you, you say echo, what, percent path percent or something like that, or no, percent temp. Well, one thing you can do is inside FileMaker is use the get temporary path folder, and, okay. it, and that'll show you what folder that FileMaker is using directly there. And okay. somewhere near there will most likely be the cache folder. If you Go to your favorite browser. Sometimes they have a. They'll show the GUI of where the the cache folder that uh, all programs are supposed to store cache data. And that's the same on the server also. Um, yeah, I believe so. Yeah. Okay. I was hoping you could explain what happens when we use FileMaker to save a compacted copy of a file, and when we or how often. That little graph that I showed you was, you know, what it's doing at that point. It's, it's going through each block and saying that this block has, is almost full, but there's a little bit of chunk here. I can move that over there and move it in there. So it, it compresses the stuff down. Um, I don't know if it's really as important as it used to be at this time. Now, if, if, you do, if you're doing a type of operation where you go through and then, like, you maybe once quarterly you, you push in a whole bunch of data or you make big changes and stuff like that, and then the, and then the data doesn't change much for the next you know, three months until the next end of quarter. Maybe then I would maybe do a save a compressed copy at that point, so it, it'll be a little bit faster during those three months that, you know, the data isn't changing. But if you have a system where you're changing data regularly and stuff like that, you actually want some free space in all these blocks so that, that, so that we, one of the slowest operations in HBAM is when you have to split one of these blocks to fit another leaf into it. So if there's data coming in and going out uh, regularly, you with uh, some free space in each block to put some more data into. 
Uh, and that, that's especially true when you get to the indexes, when things are coming in and out, getting added and deleted regularly inside there. So it really kind of depends on your data model. Uh, I, I really only recommend it if, you, if you're in some type of operation where the data uh, stays stable for a long period of time, and at that point, compression. Thank you. Oh, and don't compact right before doing a, uh, using the EAR uh, compression operation. Because the problem is that when, when we uh, encrypt a file, we need, a, we need uh, 12 more bytes or 16 more bytes or something like that. We need a little bit of space in each block for the encryption mechanism. And if you do the compa compact before you do the encryption, that means we have to go through and we have to split every block during the encryption process. So you definitely don't want to compact before you do the encryption. That, that, that is like one of the very slowest operations you could ever do inside FileMaker. You mentioned an issue that you found in uh, Go 14 that you fixed um, for 15. I'm just curious how that presents in 14. I'm guessing on the context it opens files slowly. Um, oh, oh, on Go on 14, the 14 version of Go. It's. I think you had to do something with a custom menu when um, on the second layout that you use. It was really pretty obscure. Oh. Um, and usually, I don't know how many, how many people use custom menus on, I mean, they do do something, but okay, I saw one hand. It, so it's something that many people probably would never run into, but it is something that, because you use custom menus all the time in the pro client and stuff like that. So. It was something that would affect the Go product, too. Thanks. Hi, Clay. Thanks Hello. for the presentation. Um, feature request. Uh, how can we know the size of each table in kilobytes? Because uh, if I go, I, I can see the number of fields and the number of records but I don't know the size. So for example, now I have a two gig uh, database mm -hmm. and I really don't know what table is the one yeah. that's causing the f to have such a large file. Okay, well, uh, there's a couple questions when you get to that right away is, is in units of Unicode characters or in units of bytes or? Do you, bytes. I think, yeah. And, so if there's a container field that has a reference count of five, should we count that container file five times? Or you, or you just want to no, know I, how I much just, space that that one table is eating up yeah. in FileMaker, no matter how yeah, it's Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just, just that table that has 300,000 300, records. So something more like a percentage of the file would probably be yeah. what you want to say, or something like that. Yeah. yeah um, we could track that. Um, the, the unfortunate thing about adding statistics and stuff like that in there is that uh, when you, when, if we add a feature like that into the file format and then you take it back to an older version of FileMaker, it wouldn't keep that data up to date. Yeah. Um, this is like a, a, that'd be a type of feature that we would hold off to the next file format change so that we'd be guaranteed that, you know, no client could get that, that number wrong. But um, we, we can write that down and keep that as part of statistics that you may want. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So you, you spoke a little bit about the cost benefit of one file versus multiple files and reconciling the graph and so forth. And, you know, maybe an efficiency in splitting to a separate file from a standpoint of the stability of the file size itself. Mm -hmm. Can you further offer an opinion on the benefit of adding another server for that second file to get around some threading and concurrency issues uh, with dealing with transactions in those tables. If I go to two servers with two files split up, is there some benefit there or does the cost benefit negate each other? Um, it really depends on the type of operation. Well, it really depends more on the type of queries you're doing. If you're just pushing data to two servers in two tables that are not interrelated in any way, but uh, one thing I was just mentioning is that the client has to determine where the work can be done uh, for doing certain types of queries. So if you're doing a query that needs information from both types of tables, that means the work actually has to be done on the client and can't be done on the server. Right. So in that case, it may ask the server to do you know, partial joins on, on 
thousands of those data and ask each one to send the response back to him, back to the client. And the client has to do all the work of combining that stuff to eventually display it to the user. Whereas if the tables were all on one server, it just sends one request to the server saying, do all this work for me. It can all be done on the one server. And then the one response comes back, and the client doesn't need to do anything at all. So you have to look at the data model. If it's a very simple data model where you're just pushing data to multiple tables that you aren't doing inter interconnected queries between the two of them, then it may be faster to actually split it up that way. But it really depends on your data set and how you're using it. Perfect. Thanks. Mm -hmm. And I guess that this will be the last one back here because we're running out. Thank you. Uh, if we have a Go client writing to a server over a mobile network, uh, we're writing to a, a temp file on the client and then a temp file on the server, and then it's getting written to the database. Is that what I understood? Yes. And on Go, when you're editing the stuff, you're dealing with the temp client. When you commit the changes, the data from that temp file gets moved to the temp file on the host on all the different portions of that data that you've edited. And then once that's all up there, then a final commit operation is done to actually do the final commit on the server itself. So if we have any interruption with this signal, are, are we still, uh, is it still possible to end up with a corrupt record or a ghost record? No, once, I mean, as the data is getting uploaded, I mean, to the temp file, uh, it, it's stored in a location that uh, will be basically be ignored if it never gets the commit operation call that comes at the end. And the, the, the operation, the, the remote call that does the commit operation is basically one that the client doesn't need any special response from. So it, it sends the, the, the request over there, and then, then the server does the work. And the server will do the work once it gets the request. If the client dies while the server is processing the request, the request is still going to get completely done. It's going to be finished. So you won't lose the data. The client won't get the response back saying that the host has finished doing the data, but the client is gone anyway, and it won't ever care. Right, so, so that's the data for the record should be there. Yes, yeah, the data is all on the server. Now, if the server crashes during the middle of that process, that's a different problem. No, just but the no, no, but we, we guarantee that the network won't cause the Okay, so we were used to end up with ghost records on occasion, and I was always told it was because of a network issue, but that shouldn't happen anymore. No, it won't be that issue. It could be other issues going on, but it's not that issue. Okay. Okay, well, th uh, remember to do, um, you know, fill out your evaluations and stuff like that. So thanks. <laughs>